Hawaii National Conference. Uh, this is so exciting to share this time. Thank you for joining this workshop. Uh, especially, it's uh, a very humble of you to want to have a workshop on communication uh, because a lot of people don't want to admit that communication is difficult. Uh, but it is definitely difficult with our young people. Um, whether your children are already adults, college and upper, or high school, junior high especially, right? So uh, I want to start off with just a survey of this room. How many of you experienced a time when with your child or teen, you're like thinking, why don't they talk to me? How come they don't want to talk to me? Is there any time that you ever feel that way? <laughs> yeah, okay, at least half the room. Um, so my mom actually used to um, complain to me into my face, to my face. How come you don't want to talk to me? Why don't you tell me some stories? What about your life? And I was just kind of quiet because <laughs> I didn't want to share uh, what I was really thinking. So we're going to talk about communication today. And this is so important because majority of people think I communicate well but we're going to find out how actually it's tougher than we think now the meaning of that word communication it means exchanging information thoughts ideas advice this exchanging of it and the result of good communication with a, a result of successful communication is when the two people, two parties, the sender and the receiver of that information, are both satisfied. When the person who's sharing feels they are understood and everything is received, and even the receiver felt, okay, I, I also felt hurt. So two parties are satisfied. So we have to um, analyze, how do you communicate with one another? Do you engage in exchanging and sharing, or just telling and instructing? Right? Uh, usually it's one or the other, or a combination of both. And many Asian families, and I am part of one of them, right? especially the adult figure, we do a lot of assuming. And as the child figure, I had to do a lot of assuming of what my parents were thinking. Um, and sometimes we engage in a habit of just talking, 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 and not waiting for the other person to really finish what they want to say. So that is something some of us have a habit for. So this seminar will be helpful because we, we are going to discuss background, uh, culture, development of our children so that you can have a better grasp a better understanding about communication style, ability, because if we don't understand basics of cultural differences and background and development, then we cannot interpret the style and effectiveness uh, of our communication. So let's go into this next uh, concept, which is called individualism versus collectivism. If you've never seen this um, or heard about it, when I first learned that word, collectivism, individualism, and how I am growing up uh, in the middle of both, it made so much more sense for me when I was growing up. And not one or the other is better. Okay? This is not something we're saying individualism better, collectivism better. They both have great aspects, and they both have aspects that make people misunderstand one. Another. That's why we need to learn about the difference. So first we're going to review the one on the right side, collectivism. And that word collectivistic means that my identity is being part of the group. It is I it is me being a member of the family, church, and community. I'm a representative. That means the we of the of the group is a, has more importance than just the individual within that group. So that's what collectivism is. And some of the characteristics of collectivism is, for example, 
being very implicit, which means um, opposite of explicit. Explicit means uh, being very expressive and uh, very honest. So implicit uh, communication or implicit thinking is a lot of assuming, guessing, speculating, without any audible words to confirm. You have to read a lot of body, uh, uh, body language, and you have to sort of guess. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example. So my best friend saw me invite my mom to, to lunch, come have lunch with us. And she said no. So I said, okay, she doesn't wanna have lunch with us. And my friend said, no, 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 you have to ask her one more time. I go, okay, okay, mom, have, have lunch with us. And she's like, no, I told you, I said no. And I said, she said no, twice. <laughs> and then my, my friend, who understood very much this collectivism, said, you have to ask a third time and be more serious that you want her to join us for lunch. Mom, you need to eat lunch. You know, what are you gonna eat lunch? Just come with us quickly. Okay. <laughs> I was so confused, right? So that implicit, assuming, guessing, is happening a lot. Another character is the top-down, right? The top-down uh, view and respect. The senior and the elder always has the authority, even if the junior, the younger, doesn't agree. And that is passed down for all the generations in this collectivistic culture. And I have to honor my elder all the time. And the way they think I should honor them is the way I have to do it. So that is a very common amongst all of the collectivistic um, uh, cultures. Another character is being a reflection of one another. My success determines your success. Your success will reflect that I am a successful parent. Okay? So that's something that is very, very common. What you do represents me. Your failure, your success represents mine. So that is very common, and I, I learned that in Korea, I don't know if this is in other Asian cultures, if a crime is committed by, by the uh, parent, and the parent passes away, that crime or the debt of that crime passes to the next generation. So it's like the whole family is a criminal, right? So that, that was really shocking to me when I first learned that. This reflection kind of character. And another one is the emphasis on group thinking. Okay? How will my behavior affect the reputation and the well-being of the group? So that's why the whole group will be ashamed, maybe, if somebody is uh, making a mistake or committed a crime. But the whole group will be so excited and proud if there was a success. Of, of someone, for example, sports is a very good example, right? Now, majority of the Asian American families and Latino American families in America, they operate under this culture of collectivism. And, and uh, so let's move on toward the individualism. Individualism on this left side right here is individualistic. Okay? What that means is the center of importance is the individual. I am at the center. It's me-centered. And what will benefit me? Right? So the, the, all the focus is just on the individual. That's why the image on the left is just one little body right there. Um, so what are, what's the main difference of a characteristic? It would be language. The language is where you can tell that the culture of someone, where they grew up. The language of individualism is very explicit, expressive, and um, very audible. Right? It is where two people, even though there's a senior and a junior, they communicate uh, in a conversation, sharing their ideas and opinions, even if they don't agree, and they're able to share that without any interruption, typically, and agree to disagree, actually. And there's a lot of conversation. Sometimes it looks like negotiation or, or uh, 
debating, but when I was growing up, I did not have the permission to do that. I did not have the permission, right? Because it was a collectivistic upbringing. So you can imagine how this can cause confusion in our young people today who live within our families, Asian families, but they're growing up in America because the education in America is a leaning toward individualism thinking because the majority of the instructors and teachers, they grew up here in America. So their education, the education system here is going to focus on the individual, the individual needs. So if you get the A and you don't get the A, well, then you don't get the A. The teacher does not feel affected by their students' grades. It, it doesn't shame the, the teacher, for example. Uh, so as parents and as children of parents who um, grew up collectivistically, if we don't understand this difference, okay, then there could be some conflict. Okay? There could be so much confusion. Now the next section I want to review is another area where we learned about cultural differences a few minutes ago, and now if we learn about developmental stages of our young people, this can also help uh, why there is conflict in our communication. So, uh, for example, the basic needs upon birth, right? Being fed, being clothed, and guided, everyone in the world, right? agrees that the parents or the guardians, they must provide this. Obviously, right? when you were born, parents must be there and be involved. And in the United States, right? Uh, in the United States, until the last day of being age 17, right before turning 18, the parents are responsible for food, clothing, shelter, and education. And if the parents don't provide that according to the standards of the U.S., then the social services has a right to remove the children from the home. Look how just individualistic that is, right? So, um, so that's a law placed here. And from ages 0 to 10, which is really important, we all agree that children are 100% dependent for the food, clothing, shelter, education, and guidance. They cannot survive on their own without their parents. And regardless of collectivistic or individualistic, from zero to 10, uh, they will all follow their parents. But it's around age 11, 10, 11, 12, right, where universally also, the children begin to desire autonomy. They desire to make their own decisions. Even simple ones such as which, which shoes to wear, what clothes to wear, how they want to do their hair. Right? This is around the prepubertal junior high. Um, but there are certain collectivistic parents who still want to be in control and make all, all those decisions for them. Right? Um, but conflicts can be experienced Oppositional behaviors start to rise in this age group, um, especially if parents enforce in all the areas to, to say, I know better, you just have to obey. That red shirt is better than the white shirt, so you just have to wear it. Right? Even simple things like that, if you can imagine, 10, 11, 12 year olds are gonna start being like, oh, okay, right? So this is why we need to realize the developmental stage differences. However, on the flip side, the opposite side, if the parent says, okay, you do whatever you want, you can study whenever you want, you can study or don't study, and like, what do they know, right? What if they're not mature? What if they're not ready? So this is a very difficult time to try to guide uh, this age group, isn't it? Now, from the older teen years, right, starting from 16, 15, 16, 17, around there, they're getting ready more and more for independence, to be able to stand on their own. 
And did you know that in the US, and here's another part about being here, first day of being 18, they are considered their own legal guardian, which means they can have the legal right to make their own decisions, choose their own doctor, and even tell all of their medical providers, do not talk to my parents about my medical problems. Do not ask them for their advice, and I will make the decision by myself. That is very scary. As a physician, psychiatrist myself, I'm very, very scared when um, the new 18-year-old client of mine tells me, don't ever talk to my parents again. I'm like, oh my goodness, what do I do? <laughs> because they're still living under the parents' home. Right? They also can decide to move out, even if they're not ready, even if they're not financially stable. They said, I'll move out. Right? In America, that's what the law says. So you can imagine that the earlier stages, right, especially from age zero up until the 18, that stage, independent stage, and how they're going to manage will definitely depend on how they were uh, in the relationship with their parents from zero to 18. Now this next one is called interdependent stage. Right? So our children will grow up, get married, and have their own children, and now there is this experience of it depending on one another. So a lot of our families, three generations live in the same home, right? I've seen that a lot. And even if they're not in the same home, the parents who have children ask their older parents, right, the grandparents, for help, and now there is this exchange of depending on one another. And that is the final relationship stage. Okay, so now you've learned about how the differences in every stage of our child's life makes it different in their psychology, particularly that concept of autonomy. What I want to jump to now is regarding goal. The goals of parents and, and teachers, youth teachers and youth leaders, for our children. And I think this is good to analyze more deeply because sometimes our behavior, the way we want to love our children, our students, is because we have an intention, a good intention for them. So that's where, where that's coming from. And so um, in this uh, goal, right, what would you say, you know, most parents would say? Well, I'll tell you, in my sessions, they would all conclude I want my child to be successful. Of course, that's the goal, successful. This is why we all came to America, so we could have success here and have a chance. And then if I asked them, well, what's the deeper goal? I mean, that, that's a good goal, everybody has one. What is the deeper goal that you have for your child or your student? And they would say, well, of course, I want them to be happy. That's true, right? They want no parent no parent would want their child to be unhappy. But then they asked me, but please, can you help them be academically successful too? So they can go to the college? What we need to do is bring ourselves back to the true ultimate goal. And I want to challenge uh, this room today of what that true ultimate goal, even deeper than just success, and happy. So for example, my child, they can be happy, they can be wealthy, but oftentimes what I see is missing is that they don't know their true identity. They don't know their true um, mental, psychological, and spiritual security. So what if they do get a good career? I've seen that. What if they have good financial security, great marriage, and respect from the that's great. But what if they don't get any of those things? What if they don't get any of that? What if you didn't get any of that? Does that mean your meaning and significance is worthless? Does that mean you are going to be considered as a nobody? So on the flip side of the goal, sometimes I think parents are so worried that they're not going to uh, be financially successful, 
and then they're going to be judged by the community, and therefore I'm going to be judged as the parent. I was such a bad mom or dad because of that. Uh, so unfortunately, many, many cultures, not just Asian American cultures, all across the board, we are raising children to be very product-based, result-based, and performance-based. And that they feel it too, that that's what they are being judged by, that their value is being judged by performance and results. And we parents, we have so much pressure and um, unconsciously we relay that to our children. Right? Because I didn't have that opportunity, you need to grab that opportunity and get that success. We place that on our children sometimes, or the other way around. Because I was successful, I, am, I was a doctor and lawyer, that's why you have to be one too. There's that kind of transfer of that unconscious pressure. Okay, so what does it truly mean then to help them grow well? I think this uh, conference and the parents here, that's exactly what you want. Right? You want to help them grow well, and grow up well. I believe what that means is to, for me and my child to truly know my identity, to truly know God, and to enjoy genuine um, connection with healthy friends and with church. In that kind of environment. And so let's ask again, why is there a struggle with relationship and communication? with our children. When two people are engaged in the conversation, right, engaged in this sharing time, it needs to go somewhere. It needs to have a goal of that conversation. And where the ideas and a comfort level of both are they're comfortable to go there. Right? If there's discomfort, and there's not a willingness to go to the end of that conversation, it will not go anywhere. I was experiencing that with my mother sometimes because as soon as I was sharing a problem or my thought, I was interrupted and she gave me an answer quickly. <laughs> oh, okay, conversation's over, right? So that's just my personal example. And if our kids, right, if they don't come to us and they don't do that kind of sharing with us, where they know they can be comfortable to go all the way, they know I will be comfortable to go to the end of that conversation, then uh, where are they gonna go? Where are they gonna share this, get their ideas? Where are they gonna get their comfort from? It will be their own peers. It will be from social media, a lot from social media. And, and we know that many of their peers are not from a background where uh, the Lord is considered, right? where the gospel is considered. So we as adult caregivers, right, um, I really encourage us that we ourselves um, have to believe that it is only in Christ alone right, that I have my identity, significance, and purpose and meaning. If I really feel that for myself, then I can relay that to my children. Now this next slide, you might uh, be familiar with the words on this image. Can you see it from there? It's a picture of a tree and the, the fruit on the tree is uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. When I think about how do we help grow our children well, uh, it's about character, right? about the words on this Galatians 5. And some people think what we need to help them build regarding their character is intelligence, good grades, being popular, being good at their athletics or talents. And I've seen so many parents really, really focus only on that. I'm not saying don't focus on their academics, right? But they're just so 
on fire to do everything so they can write that on that college application so they can go to that good college, right? So it's a very, very large pressure for parents to make sure they go there. Um, but the character that I want to encourage us to kind of just pause and think about is to nurture these characters of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And remember, fruit is an outcome, right? It's something that we see with our eyes. It's something that is a result. What we don't see are the roots, the, the growing process of that. Because it's organic, and you don't manufacture it. You cannot manufacture that overnight. Um, and I believe that if these characteristics of the fruit of the Holy Spirit are developed in our children, then success in this life, however you're defining success, it will occur naturally. It will. They can be the valedictorian, and then they can go to the top medical schools, but if they don't have kindness, if they don't have goodness and patience, they're gonna make a lot of enemies, first of all. It's just practical. And sometimes I think Jesus and the Bible is just so practical. These are the characters of the Holy Spirit, and we need to um, uh, kind of want to nurture these things. It's so sad that in this current age, um, the focus is not on these things. This is a, a group of parents I know who are familiar with these words, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Um, and did you know a, a man named Mr. Rogers? Well, I'm old enough to know Mr. Rogers. And he was a minister, but he did a, a ministry on the media for children. And he once said, human beings learn from one another, especially from another person who cares about them. And so what I think that means is how we behave, how we respond to our children, um, they will learn from that. And it will be our responsibility of what they learn from my character, of how I behave to them, and how I behave to um, my other family members, and at church, they're watching us, even at church as well. Um, and I just want to take a little break and talk about development one more time. Remember we're talking about development stages of, of the earlier years and the pre-teen years and the older teen years. Just wanted to remind you that there's a difference between the left brain and the right brain. Um, I know this is getting academic, but I just want to let you know something very interesting. The left brain is more involved with logic, uh, knowledge, uh, insight, forward thinking, and thinking about consequence. Right? Thinking first before I act. Okay? The left brain does a lot of that work. The right brain is one that is dealing more with feelings, getting my needs met right now. So did you know that our children, their development of their brain continues until mid-20s? So in the teen years, which side do you think is stronger and they are reacting from more? That's right, the right. I want that now. If you don't give it to me now, I hate you. You're the worst mom in the whole wide world. Right? They're reacting from their emotions. They don't even know what they're saying. They don't even know what, I have clients who are coming to me, my, the parents are so shocked. My child says they want to kill me. I said, no, they don't really want to kill you. They, they are reacting emotionally from the, brain, the side of the brain that is developed so quickly right now and not the other side. The left brain will follow later about, let me think if I should really do that or I should do that, I should say that. That does not develop until much later. And so when we are um, reacting more emotionally rather than logically, or we see our children do that, we have to not take offense. We have to be calm and use our left brain that's supposed to be fully developed by now, right? and to think what to say. So going back to these characters, how can we help them? How can we help them build these? 
especially that word patience, right? Self-control, patience, self-control, that's more of the left brain. They're not there yet. So how do we help them? Um, so the four words that I want to give for practical uh, advice or tips, communication again. This is what this whole seminar is about anyways. Communication, and if you grew up in a collectivistic culture, which I think most of us have, and you still are in that, we have to begin actually practicing how to share verbally. Because our children cannot read our minds. But then the way we share it has to be important too, right? The listener can only guess and only assume. And they will say the same thing. How can you know me if you don't hear me? If you don't understand me, how can you know me by just guessing about me? You're guessing about my friends, you're guessing about my feelings. Okay? So as parents, we can practice asking questions and creating a safe space for the other person, which is my child, to answer. And that requires waiting and listening. Waiting and listening until they're ready. This is very difficult. Isn't it very difficult? You ask them and then they start off. They might give you one sentence. They might give you one word and then they're gonna wait to see what you say. This is very subconscious too. And then you're gonna start talking blah, blah, blah. And, and they know that's it. That was my last word. So a tip that I can provide is something actually I have to do in my own session, even though I'm not my client's parent, but I'm old enough to be their parent. They tell me something and I say, can you share more? Can you describe more? I want to understand more. What are you talking about? I can handle it, please tell me. And then you have to prove you could handle it. They don't interrupt. <laughs> so that is one tip I can give you about uh, waiting and listening. And I was thinking about my meditation with the Lord this morning. It's funny, he doesn't interrupt that at all. I'm just venting and crying and praying and he's just listening the whole entire time. And then when I'm ready, right, when I'm ready and I go to the word or he's speaking to me in message or sermon, then he's talking to me. But when I am praying and talking to him and venting and crying and asking everything and why, why this, he's really quiet, isn't he? So, something we can emulate. The next word is validation. Validation means when you're listening to whatever they're complaining about or talking about, we don't have to give the right answer quickly. Validating is showing understanding of why they are feeling the way they are. It's not agreeing. A lot of parents really struggle with this because they think validating means agreeing. That doesn't mean that. Validating means I hear that you're having a hard time. That must be difficult for you. But inside, it doesn't mean you agree. You didn't say you did. So validating is showing understanding. And it is a, a posture of being a guide rather than a dictator. Rather than a dictator. Um, Let's move on to the troubleshooting. Troubleshooting means, uh, I, and I like that word more than uh, problem solving. Okay? As we understand and keep in mind the cultural differences of comparing how we grew up, comparing to how they are growing up right now, right, in the individualistic educational system, um, that we are in the posture of, do we want to help them through their struggles, not just fix it for them. This is called troubleshooting. And the one way to know, maybe have some wisdom how to do that is, we have to be informed of what their current struggles are today uh, and what the teens are struggling in general. Because it's different from when we were teens. And that's also starting off with listening. Okay? And this is so challenging to do because we want to allow independence and autonomy 
so that we have something to troubleshoot with them and for them. And we have to have this possibility, we have to permit the possibility that they will make a mistake. We have to make the environment not so anxious for them to make a mistake and realize I still love them as unconditionally as possible. Um, and even if they make the wrong choice, that I'm still there to help guide them. Many times they do things behind our back because they know it's a wrong choice and they know how we're going to punish or we're going to react. But we need to help them experience those natural consequences. And then the last word is counsel. Very similar to the other ones, but um, as we receive that continuous counseling from the Holy Spirit, our posture as a parent or a teacher is counseling more than commanding. Counseling rather than commanding and demanding. Um, I'm sorry, but our children these days, if you are demanding, commanding, <laughs> they are so individualistic in their thinking, they are not gonna take that from us. They won't. So we have to change our strategy and how to preserve our collectivistic beliefs and how we honor, but also how to, how to navigate the system that they're growing up in. Um, we want to lead and guide and instruct, or we have to let them think we are leading and guiding and instructing patiently and explain the consequences. If you do this, this is what is going to happen and uh, allow them to make that decision right, instead of us trying to help them avoid it at all costs. Uh, as we're praying and focusing on building their character, we have to remember it's very organic, right? very internal, kind of like a plant, right? You can't force the shoots to go up and the branches to branch out quickly because it's not mechanical, it's not man-made. So in conclusion, these fruit of the Holy Spirit right, is not by my strength, their strength, your effort or their effort. It's not by man's effort. It isn't. Um, the phrase, as we know, of the Holy Spirit, fruit of the Holy Spirit, means that uh, the seed is Jesus Christ, right? And it is his grace, it is his power that grows these fruits. And this is very, very deep and abstract. But we have to remember it's of the Holy Spirit, not manufactured and made and, uh, and, and drawn out by our own understanding. So if it's God's work, then what do we do then? But if God has to do it, then what about us as parents, the guide? I want it to be kind of like a gardener. Think of it as we are the gardener. We don't make the things grow, right, as a gardener. The gardener creates the condition in the garden, in the soil and in the pots, through which the power of the seed is released. So we are nurturing the ground and the environment and then allow the seed, which is Jesus Christ, the spirit of Jesus, to do that work. And that definitely comes with constant prayer, constant receiving of great advice from one another and from our own mentors as well. So that concludes this part. And this is a uh, time to scan. If you haven't scanned, and type in your anonymous questions, and Dr. Mijin will be joining uh, me up here to do uh, Q&A for you. And I think we have a time limit, so we'll just go through as many, right, as possible. Oh, this is our website and our QR code to our website. If you ever wanted to look at all of the blogs and all of the resources that we have, including the Fully Health Clinic. Uh, Dr. Esther, 
Um, now is the time for our Q&A. And so if you have a question, you can all um, scan the very top QR code and you can uh, post an anonymous question. So already we have two questions coming in that we can start off if uh, you both are ready. So we'll, we'll start off with in order um, coming from the link. Okay. I think it's a good good one to start with. So, are you ready? So here's the question. Um, why do teens seem to isolate themselves and don't want to talk to their parents? Good question. Why do teens isolate themselves and don't want to talk to their parents? So, go ahead. Um. Hello, I'm Dr. Min-jin. So, what do you think? <laughs> Sometimes I'm asking them, our parents, um, was your child, um, even when she was younger, was she like that? And they said, no. They're so talkative, they always want to be with me, you know, they wanted to play with me, it's just all of a sudden that child or my son and daughter don't want to talk to me and being in the room. Uh, a lot of the things where Dr. Esther uh, presented it today uh, answer to that question. One thing that what we needed to ask the question that uh, a child, if they, are, they don't want to talk to us, and also they are isolated in the room, which means, number one, they don't trust you. Then number two, they don't feel that they are understood by you. Again, the, it, it could be a little bit of different too, the child's, um, uh, or communication can be a big thing and language can be a big thing too. The reason why Dr. Esther was sharing today is we needed to understand both culture and language too. So our children in the school are learning that you needed to be expressive, and then somebody who cares about you will listen to you rather than interrupting you. Right? But collectivistic culture is a completely different way of communicating, and then for us, children obey to us, say yes to everything, is the good child. So oftentimes when our child are not listening to us, automatically how they're you, that you are not. And then because of our own anxiety as a parent also, that we are creating too many of the restrictions, the things that they wanted to share with us, we are just shutting them down. Instead of, as the Dr. Esther said, it's just rather than listening to them. Another thing is, regardless of the culture and language, even me growing up in Korea uh, with my mom and my parents, we grew up in the same culture. We grew up in the same language, but there's a generational gap too. There's a, some cultural trend that we also needed to understand that what's going on, how they are getting information. So we needed to be a little bit more curious uh, for them uh, to share with us. So again, uh, safety that uh, our children can come to me, they feel uh, understood or heard will be the uh, important factor that you know it will continue. But it is not a uh, right away or just out of uh, out of the blue that my child is suddenly is isolating. Of course, there's any uh, many other factors too. So sometimes our teenagers, if they are starting to use um, uh, substances, uh, is it? Uh, another reason why they are suddenly changing their behaviors too. So we kind of needed to uh, create a safety only on so that our children can start uh, share about their difficulties uh, in any topics, in any manner. Thank you, Dr. S, uh, Dr. Newton. Um, this is such a wonderful presentation but we do have a time limit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna read them and then maybe, because we actually only have like a little over 10 minutes because we have another workshop and 
there's an ordination service at two o'clock too. So, um, but we'll give you the slides and we'll have a form if you want to um, get more information. But let me read through them all and then maybe you can kind of choose through that. Yeah. Um, so this is the second question is how can parents begin to salvage a traumatic relationship with their kids? Um, another one is how to prepare the soil so Jesus can come in. How to get daughter to open up about liking boys. How do I know whether I let my child learn from their own mistakes or intervene and teach them? How to lead a college child to have faith with God and how to help a child always angry. So I feel like the traumatic one is, is a good start and that kind of might relate to the anger issue or the, um, you know, uh, learning from mistakes. And the specific thing about like boys opening up, I think that's a communic like relational communication. So, so I, I would start maybe with the traumatic one, do you think? Okay, my understanding of this question is that something has happened where the relationship of the parent and child suddenly stopped in terms of communication and, uh, and it's determined that it's because of that traumatic moment. Regardless if it is the child's fault or the parent's fault regarding whatever has happened, now, uh, it, it's best to not uh, go to the direction of like whose fault it was, but it always does take the older person, the adult figure, to open up that conversation and to own up uh, there's something that I have done or I have said that has made this relationship very uncomfortable for you and me. I would like to begin uh, working on that and repairing that. Can, can you and I start talking a little bit of, of how I made you feel uh, and, and just kind of inviting the situation where uh, they feel safe to share how they got hurt or what have you. It may even be so menial and trivial, uh, but they do have to have a time to think that their voice is being heard. So that, that's my one way to answer that. And I think a good one for Dr. Nijin is this one. How do I know whether I let my child learn from their own mistakes or intervene and teach them in advance? We as an adult, uh, we know a little bit more than the, our younger children. Sometimes we use the word wisdom, right? Because we went through uh, their age and life uh, span that we know what's a path, right? So which means we have to think a couple steps ahead, but we needed to create an outer frame that how much is enough to protect my children, how far we can go, how far we can allow. One picture that I just thought about is, often we see the father uh, that uh, asks the little ch uh, child to put it on the um, higher, uh, uh, what is that called? Shelves or the desk, and they say, jump, jump at me, right? Do you remember? I think some of you already did with your children too. When they're very, very young, it's just kind of cute that they will jump at you and then you can hold it, right? Because you know the what distance will be safe for your child to jump at it. But your child is only looking at you. If they are looking down, how high that is, they will be scared to that because the fear is one of the human instinct, they were not gonna jump. But when they're looking at you and making eye contact, they, they don't care how dangerous or how high uh, that could be, they will jump at you because trusting you that you will hold it. But also parents' point of view, you know how far you need to stand. Your child will jump and how, uh, what kind of distance that they will land on you, and on you safely, right? So that is the same way that we needed to create our own distance, the how much and how far, what, what uh, degree that we can allow our children. When you really sit down and think about, you will know. You will know 
the uh, how much you can allow your child to exercise on it, and then how much of a mistake, so what degree of a mistake is okay not to hurt them, but they can learn that. So. Thank you. This next two questions, I think I will try to take a stab at it together. How to prepare the soil so Jesus can come in, and the one that says how to lead a college child to have faith in with God. So it's very similar to me. Uh, my simple answer, since the time is short, is as a parent, okay, you yourself enjoy Jesus. To ask yourself every day and ask God, how can I enjoy Emmanuel? How can I enjoy the presence of God? How can I understand my own salvation and the blessings of being saved? How can I show that I am enjoying you so much of your love, joy, and peace? Because if that happens, your children will see that. They will see that and they will gravitate and be attracted to that. I promise you, because it happened to me, as I saw my parents, they did not care. Well, they did care about my grades, but they didn't check up on me. They didn't check up on those things. They didn't check up if I was on time at school and what kind of friends I had. I don't know why, what happened <laughs> and why they were so trusting. But what I did see in them is sometimes they love being in prayer and in the Word and they were just uh, praising God and just enjoying that relationship with God that I kind of wondered, what brings them that happiness? What's going on? So I'm challenging the parents, before you get really pressured, what do I do, how do I help them, uh, especially because I showed you those slides about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is that I enjoy that fruit growing in me first. <laughs>